Hello, everyone, and welcome to everyone watching online. Um, what I want to talk about today is hopefully complement some of the stuff that's been going on and just give some cases. I think it's helpful to frame some of the th concepts that we've been learning so far and maybe add a little bit of depth to some of these things because I think echo is all about repetition. You know, it's not one thing where you kind of learn it, memorize it, and you're done. But repetition and layering of information is really, really important. Um, well, my name is Haney Malamat. Uh, if you're on social media, I'm at Critical Care now. And I bring that up because um, I know absolutely zero French. And well, that's not true. I know uh, bonjour, I know uh, merci, and fromage. <laughs> that's it. That's all I got. So I hope I'll never go hungry if I'm ever lost in France, uh, but I know how to be polite. So I'm going to say, if you're on social media or if you're at home, please tweet me some French words, and I'll see if I can smatter them out during the whole course. But be careful, because it's a, it's a family show. So don't send anything too nasty, because I have no idea what I'm going to say. <laughs> all right, so let's just give you a case, all right? A little bit of perspective. Let's give you a, a young lady who's 38 weeks pregnant, who comes in with anasarca, and she's hypotensive, OK? That's all you get. And you know, it's bad enough that a pregnant patient is coming during your shift. We always hate dealing with sick pregnant patients, because there could be anything going on. And we have two patients that could potentially sue us. But, um, Here's your case. So this is an apical four-chamber view. Okay, so we're looking at the apex of the heart, and I'll, I'll describe how to do this in just a moment. But what we have over here is we have our, does anyone want to take a guess what this is? What ventricle? Left ventricle, good. And how about this one over here? Right, okay. So what do you think about this overall, the function? I mean, you already saw that it doesn't take a lot to sort of understand what the function is. I'm not asking what the ejection fraction is. Please don't say it's 35%. Just tell me. The ventricles, good or bad? Both of them are pretty bad? OK, I agree with you. So let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, let's talk first about right ventricular size. I think the right ventricle, unfortunately, is the underappreciated ventricle. We always resuscitate. We always look at the LV. We love the LV. And the RV is just sitting there. It's like, why is there no love? Why is there no love for me, the RV? The RV is really important because it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, sensitive, let's put it that way, it's a very sensitive ventricle. Um, it doesn't take stress very well, it doesn't take volume very well, and decompensates. It's thin-walled. And so more and more modern resuscitationists are starting to pay attention to the right ventricle versus the left ventricle. The left ventricle can handle anything, right? But the right ventricle can't handle a lot of stress. So resuscitating towards the right ventricle is starting to emerge as potentially one of the goals that we want to do. So the way you do this is you go to your apical view, which is either your point of maximal impulse, but even simpler is at your fourth or fifth intercostal space at the anterior axillary line. And what you can do is put the marker facing down towards the bed. Anywhere from the bed to the axilla is going to be your frame that you're going to go through. And here's a cartoon of how it looks like. So we already identified the one on this side of the screen when our dot is over here in the cardiac mode is that's the left ventricle, nice conically shaped thick walled. And then we have our poor right atrium, mitral, and tricuspid valve. So this is how it looks normally. This apical four-chamber view is good for a few reasons, and I'll go over them in just a bit. But the, one of the first reasons is because it gives you relative sizes of the ventricles. It gives you a relation of the LV to the RV. Now, normally, the RV to the LV, so LV, RV, should be about 2 thirds. So the RV should be about 2 thirds, or 66% of the LV, and that's normal. So this view is good because it puts them side by side and gives you a better understanding of what's going on. So here's a case where the RV is not quite 66%, but it's not quite the same size as the LV. And so this is going to be mild dilation of the LV. So here we're not talking about function. We're just talking about sizes. And so here we have one where they're, they're pretty much one to one. Would you agree? So we have our LV over here, our RV over here. They're about the same size. And what we're going to call this is moderate dysfunction. And the final category, as you can guess already, is that severe dysfunction. And that's where the RV is greater than the LV. It's almost to the point where you put the probe down, and you have to like, which way am I holding the probe? Is this the LV? Is this the RV? You really have to sort of sort things out. And I'll show you some tips on how you can do that without looking down at the probe, because you don't want to look uncool in front of your trainees, right? You always want to look like you know what you're talking about. So if you don't like the subjective way of looking at things, if you're not one to just sort of sit back and say, hmm, what is this? You can do it objectively. I don't routinely do this. I hardly ever do this at all, in fact. But you can measure at the base right here of the RV. That should be 42 millimeters. mid cavitary should be 35. And then the longitudinal axis should be 86. So then 
you'll know that many, many people have chronic diseases like pulmonary hypertension, maybe they had a PE before and their RV never recovered. So how are you gonna tell the difference between acute and chronic? That's gonna be one of the tasks you're gonna be dealt with when you see someone with a really big RV. Is their RV big because of something that just happened now? Or was it big before and something is going on? So we're gonna to have to figure out acute versus chronic and there's a couple quick things you can do. None of this stuff is, is difficult to do. They're all quick little things that you can do at the bedside. The first thing is look for a moderator band and the moderator band with RV chronic hypertrophy, like any muscle, hypertrophies up. So it looks a little thicker than normal. Now normally you shouldn't see the moderator band, so if you really start to see it, that should clue you in that this RV has been chronically hypertrophied. This, this heart has been pushing against a uh, big afterload and now the muscle's getting swollen. Also prominent trabeculae. Look how prominent these trabeculae are right here. You see that? The RV is very thin walled, should be less than five millimeters in depth. But if you look here, this whole wall is really thick and hypertrophy, this free wall of the RV. Another clue that this dilation right here didn't just happen today. And the final thing is measuring the free wall, which I'll show you how to do in this view, in a, in a different view. So here's an example right here. Who wants to take a guess what that is right there? Come on, crowd participation time. Have some fun. No? No one? Moderator band. I like your style. See? Nice, thick moderator band right there. The best view to assess free wall hypertrophy is in the subcostal view. Now, some of the principles of ultrasound, there's really only like two basic principles to remember. I'm not big into the physics. But whenever you're looking at something in 2D echo, you want to be as perpendicular as possible to get the most accurate measurement. So perpendicular as possible. We didn't measure the free wall in the apical four chamber view because the free wall was almost parallel to the beams coming down. And so we get erroneous measurements. But when we come perpendicular, like in the subcostal four chamber view, we can make really accurate measurements of the free wall. The other principle we'll talk about in a little bit is Doppler, and that's more parallel. But just for now, 2D echo, I'm um, sorry, B mode echo, brightness mode, this right here, gray mode, is more perpendicular, the more accurate the measurement. And so right here, we see a normal measurement. This is less than five millimeters, and we want to measure this during diastole. We don't want to measure it during systole, because obviously during systole, it's going to contract and it'll look big. So we want to measure when it's the most relaxed during diastole. And as I said, less than five millimeters is normal. So if you're assessing someone with a big dilated RV, but their free wall is less than five millimeters, that's an acute process. That's the person that comes in with a big submassive PE. Contrast it to this patient over here. This person has a pretty thick wall, right? And so when you do your measurements during diastole, you find that their measurement is, let's say, you know, seven or eight millimeters. That's abnormal, okay? So that patient that we just saw there, the young pregnant patient with dilated ventricles bilaterally and comes in acutely um, sick, what do you think they had? They're pregnant, that's the clue. PE could be one thought, but their, their LV was also pretty dilated too. Cardiomyopathy, right? Peripartum cardiomyopathy. So that's that case right there. Okay, so one view, you saw both chambers were dilated. It leads you in the direction. And then what do you expect her free wall to be? Her free wall to be chronically hypertrophied or, or acutely? Acutely, very good. All right, let's move on to a different case. Patient from a nursing home, hypotensive, febrile, breathing fast. And automatically, you do your physical exam, and you can't help but notice that there's a Foley in there. No one knows why it's there. The family says it's been there. We thought it's just part of the process of being in a nursing home, which is kind of true. But unfortunately, this is what this lady comes in, just a layer of pus right here. So what do you think is going on? No tricks, I promise. No tricks. Any of these slides. Eurocepts is great. Okay? She's also confused as well. Okay? So you start resuscitating her, um, as we do, right? Fluids and antibiotics, all that good stuff. And you give fluids, but she's still hypotensive. And then someone gets the bright idea. Let's take a look at her heart. So again, apical four-chamber view here. Okay, the LV here looks to be contracting normally. What do you think about the RV? First, what do you think about the size? Is it normal or is it big? Okay, good, we'll keep it at that. And then function, we're gonna get into that just a little bit, what the function is, but anyone wanna take a guess what the function is? Good or bad? Good, so the RV is very simple. It's not as complicated as the LV, which has three choices. The RV is just two, good or bad. So do you give this person more fluids is the question. Remember what I said about the RV? It's that sensitive, you know, just please don't hurt me type of ventricle. So this person probably shouldn't get fluids because their RV is already down systolically and already dilated. You get another view here. So we just covered this last lecture. So what view is this? I'll give you a clue. This is liver. 
subcostal. And what's this structure right there? Good. And th well, that's the? Good. So what do you think is happening in the IVC with respirations? Yeah. So this is reflecting the right atrial pressures in an RV that's barely systolically collapsing. So it gives us a clue that this person's right side is not really working well. So by giving more fluids, maybe we're not doing the right thing here. Maybe that's not the right approach for this person at this time. So let's get into a little bit of right, right ventricular function, because again, I think the RV is a very, very important structure that we need to pay more attention while we're acutely resuscitating people. Okay, so normal parasternal, I'm sorry, normal apical four-chamber view. Remember, the RV, the reason why it's so special is it only contracts in one direction. The muscle fibers are longitudinal and basically contracts from the base over here towards the apex, only in one direction. The LV contracts in so many different ways, like six different ways it contracts. It's a very powerful uh, ventricle, but the RV only contracts one way up and down. And this is good because we can use something called TAPSI to assess right ventricular function. So I'll say this now. Don't worry if you don't remember, but remember this because you're going to sound awesome next time you get to your clinical shift. TAPSI stands for tricuspid annular, because that's tricuspid annular, plane of systolic excursion. Okay? Tricuspid annular plane of systolic excursion. Just say TAPSI. You'll sound awesome. But what that means is how much is that tricuspid valve moving in the plane during cystine and diastole? Because as I said, the right ventricle only knows one dimension, up and down. So if you, if you look at how much this annulus is moving, it gives you a sense of how well the systolic function is doing. So here we go from here, and we look at this annulus, and this is moving normally. Normally should be greater than 16 millimeters. You can also eyeball it, but normally should be 16 millimeters. I'll show you how to measure it exactly. So we look now at this tricuspid annulus, and it's really just the lateral plane of the annulus. What do you think, good or bad? Bad. And this one's actually only moving seven millimeters. Now you're like, your eyes are really good. Seven millimeters, you must be highly trained. And I'm not. The reason why is just you can eyeball it and be done with it. If you really want to measure it, and the reason why I know it's seven millimeters is because I used M mode. And so in cardiology labs, I'll tell you this right now, they sound all smart and stuff, but all they're doing most of the time is just eyeballing it. And sometimes they'll add M mode in there just to deep dive it a little more, just been, it's kind of on the border to see what's going on. They'll add a little M mode. So let me show you how to do that. Essentially what you're going to do is an apical four-chamber view. Now, this is not projecting well, but this is the free wall of the RV here, and here's your tricuspid annulus right there. And you can eyeball it right now and say it's not working well. Would you all agree? But we're going to put an M-mode cursor right there on that lateral portion of the tricuspid annulus, and we're going to run M-mode over it. And look what happens with M-mode. So what we have here is we have all the stuff we don't care about, but down here we have the plane of the tricuspid valve as it's moving up and down. So we're measuring how far it moves. Here's at diastole, and this is the beginning of systole. That's the end of systole right there. You see how much it moves? Because it only moves in one plane. That's all you have to do, measure. So this one's working 10 millimeters. So this is normal or abnormal? What's normal again? 16, great. Again, these numbers are less important than you getting the concepts. I can give you these slides later if you want to memorize numbers. It's not that important. All right, apical four-chamber view. Dots this way. So what chamber is this? And this one is? Let me give you some clinical context. Person comes to dysnic, has a history of cancer, and they're satting at 85%. So what's the diagnosis? See, no tricks, I promised you, right? So now that if I tell you they're hypotensive, now you start to think that this is a massive PE, right? This is a hemodynamically significant PE. One, one thing I want to point out is look at this RV. It's trying to pump against what you'd imagine there to be a PE distally. Look at this LV. Do you think it's normal, hyperdynamic, or bad? Hyperdynamic. And why is it hyperdynamic? Because it doesn't get filled by the, with the blood coming through the RV. You're smart. You go down, look at the lower extremity veins. And I know we didn't cover this over here, but this is your femoral artery and some of the femoral veins over here. And look what happens. What's in there? Does everyone see the clot? You can't compress this down. Normally, these veins should be able to be compressible, and here they're not compressing because there's clots distally, and that's probably where that PE broke off from. But here's the, re here's the real point of this case. So now, what view is this? Anyone want to throw it out there? Parasternal short axis view, great. And this is at the level of the mitral valve. And what do you notice? Anything abnormal here? I saw someone doing this, dancing, doing a little, what's up, baby? How you doing? 
What's this? What's the septum is? Getting flat, right? Good. So that's septal flattening. So let's talk a little bit about this. Why, how the septum can really help us determine if there's any underlying pathology um, on the right side of the heart. So this is normal. Normally, throughout systole and diastole, you'll notice that that interventricular septum stays concave relative to that LV. That's normal. Every beat stays normal. It looks just like this. What happens when we have pathology to the right side, whether it's a whether it's a pressure overload or a volume overload, we start to get septal flattening. And depending on what phase of systole or diastole that flattening is occurring, it's telling us what's going on. So here we're having flattening that's happening during systole. So this is consistent with pressure overload, pre high pressures on the right side of the heart. So this person with the acute PE had septal flattening during their systolic phase because that's a pressure overload. So if you have septal flattening happening during diastole, that's consistent with a volume overload, someone with just too much volume on the right side of their heart. Now, it's happening kind of fast, and you're saying, whoa, 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 that's, that's a little bit too quick. You can always freeze frame it and cine back, and try this when you get to the stations, but when you roll back, you'll be able to see what phase the valve is opened and how flat or curved the septum is, and that's the way you tell. Sometimes you can hook EKG leads up to the machines, but I almost hardly ever do that. Um, just It's an extra step to do, so I try to use the valves to help cheat and tell me what phase of uh, systole or diastole we're in. So as I said before, this person who came in had systolic, um, had systolic flattening in the short axis view, consistent with pressure overload. Everyone with me? All right, let's talk about Ethel. Ethel's a patient who comes in. You can tell she, she loves to live life. She smokes, she has hypertension, she has all that good stuff, and she comes in with really bad chest pain. She's also short of breath, and her blood pressure is low. So what are we gonna do for this lady? We're gonna do ultrasound. And so what we have here, this is a different view. This is an apical two-chamber view. Not important to remember so much that it's a two-chamber view, but this is a parasternal short axis view rotated just a little bit, and I think we'll talk about that this afternoon. But essentially, this is the left ventricle, and this is the left atrium. And so we're putting Doppler, okay? We're putting color Doppler on to tell us which way the blood is flowing. And so you see that during, during systole, there's a predominant flow that's coming away from this valve right here that's going down, and this is mitral regurgitation, severe mitral regurgitation. This is the cause. She's having an MI, and she's having dysfunction of her, of her chamber, and that's why she's getting regurgitation. The valve leaflets are not co-apting very well. So let's go in, we'll talk a little bit about Doppler, and for those of you that don't know what it is, hopefully we'll clear it up. Christian Doppler, Austrian physicist, mathematician, and that's all you need to know about Christian Doppler. The other thing you need to know about him is that he was responsible for this phenomenon of Doppler shift. And you've all experienced this Doppler shift if you've ever stood on a street somewhere and listened for a police car or a fire engine. You know if the engine's coming towards you or away from you, right? I mean, you never have to, like, look. You know it's coming at you or going away. And the reason why is because as that sound is coming towards you, even though it's the same frequency, as it moves towards a stationary object, the frequency goes up, right? Has anyone not experienced this phenomenon? Are you just hungry? Is that it? All right, me too. All right, so you've all experienced that, right? So what happens if you have the frequency going away from the person who's stationary is you have a decreased frequency, right? Even if you haven't experienced this, you've seen like some Italian or French movie, right, where there's a car chase, so we all know that sound. So that's a decreased frequency, and that's, that's the principle of Doppler shift. That's really all you have to remember. We won't go into any of the physics because um, at this point, it's just not necessary. But that's that change in frequency. So what we can do now is now we can put color on that changing Doppler shift, and we can now understand which direction blood is flowing by putting color boxes over areas that we have of interest, like that valve that we showed you before. Remember the mnemonic BART. Blue stands for away from the probe, the transducer. So when we're putting the probe down, if something's flowing away from the probe, it's going to generate a blue color. And whenever something is going towards the probe, up towards the surface, up to the probe, it's going to be red. Blue away, red towards. Now, this is the second principle of ultrasound that I told you about um, that, that's kind of important. Remember that the 2D has to be perpendicular or parallel to the area of interest. 2D, grayscale, has to be perpendicular, right? Doppler is the exact opposite. Doppler shift, the more you go off the zero line, the lower your, the lower your Doppler shift gets. So you want to be as parallel as possible when you're doing Doppler, and that's why the apical four-chamber view is a really good view to do this, because the blood is flowing this way, and the Doppler beams are flowing this way. So this is really our optimal view to get this. And we, that's why we can look at the valves, the tricuspid and the mitral valve, 
even the aortic valve in a different view and interrogate them this way because the blood is going this way. So the Doppler is coming down, going through the valves, and now we can put a color box and ask a question. So you can say, hey, what's up with this blood flow? What's going on? So now this predominant flow here is blue. It's going away from the probe through the valve from the ventricle to the left atrium. So this is mitral regurgitation, right? Everyone see that predominantly blue flow? Good. Now this is because, again, her chamber got dilated. Now the valve leaflets can't co-apt well. They can't block flow from going backwards. So the valves leak through. This can happen from dilation. It can also happen from cardiac ischemia when you get one wall that's not working as well, not contracting in and causing that co-aptation. It can also happen if you have a papillary muscle um, uh, leaflet rupture. So you get a flail leaflet that just breaks off post-MI. So this is now a parasternal long axis view, not the best view to get Doppler, because remember I said it should be as, per, um, as parallel as possible. But if you see regurgitation here, then it's likely, it's likely there, because here we're almost perpendicular, and you still see. Do you see this flow right here? This blue flow is going away from the probe over here. Everyone see that? Another case of mitral regurgitation. Here's a different patient. Here what we see is a little bit of flow going, it, it's not really going towards the probe up this way, but it's kind of curving up this way. So we see a little bit of red flow here. And this is just a small amount of aortic regurgitation. Here we're um, in an apical four chamber view. This is the person with the PE before. So big PE dilates the chamber. Now those valve leaflets can't come together and they can't hold the blood back. So you have, which way do you think this blood is going? towards or away from the probe? Away, so this is tricuspid regurgitation here from dilation, another sign that this is an acute dilation. Okay, more clips of the same thing, more mitral regurgitation, blue is away, red is towards. Another example, regurgitation, I'm just gonna flip through so we can get to another case, but you all see the point. Here's severe aortic regurgitation here, so now the predominant flow during diastole is blue, it's away. Now you're seeing some red flow during systole, that's what you'd expect, right? During systole, you expect blood to go from the left ventricle over here out to the left ventricular outflow tract into the ascending aorta. That's normal, but what's not normal is you shouldn't see any blue flow going through that valve backwards, causing aortic regurgitation. And we'll just flip through that. All right, next case. Patient comes in, end-stage renal disease, that's their fistula. They come in dyspneic, and they're hypotensive. What do you think is going on here? So what view is this? Apical four, OK. And so this is our, and this is our. And what's this bright line that's all the way around here? And so what's all this in there? A fusion, right? And so let's talk a little bit about effusions and tamponade. So effusions come in different shapes and sizes. I think you're getting the sense that you're seeing more and more clips. But here's an example of a small effusion. And what we want to do is use the left atrium here in the parasternal long axis view and the descending aorta as our guides. These two are really important landmarks. Because if we see fluid coming here between these two, that's a pericardial effusion. And if it, the fluid comes here, and stops here and goes down here, whoops. If that fluid comes and stops behind the air, does not go between the two, that's a pleural effusion. Exactly. I saw you. Good. Now, we already mentioned loculated effusions. Really important to know. And there's no good classification scheme for loculated effusions. You just have to have a high clinical suspicion and really check it out. Because this almost lo looks like a pericardial fat pad right here. But this is actually a. Um, this is actually a, uh, an infected effusion right here that's just loculated right here. And there's actually very little distally here, but this is actually a person who's in tamponade um, because this is collapsing down. So just something to keep in mind. Have a high index of suspicion if you see a really big fat pad of the person's hi hypotensive. Ask yourself whether or not this is loculated or not. That's part of the talk, don't worry. 
So apical four chamber again, let's ask ourselves the question. So definitely we've identified a fusion. How are we going to know if this person's actually in tamponade? And you'll always hear the cardiologist say, it's a clinical diagnosis. And it's like, yeah, I might have to wait for them to be clinically unstable before I start. You'd like to get to that person before they get unstable. So are there any other clues we can use? And what we can do is we can actually look at the right atrial free wall here and see if there's any collapse of it. Because normally it shouldn't collapse um, more than a third of the cardiac cycle, but it really shouldn't collapse at all. So we look for right atrial systole. If that's collapsing down, again, more than one third of the RR interval, that tells us that that person likely has tamponade. We can also look at the right ventricle and see if there's any collapse during diastole, okay? Right atrial systole and right ventricular diastole are both conditions where the pressures in those chambers are very, very high. That's when they're filling. If you see collapse, it should tell you that, that the pressure outside in the pericardium is greater than the pressure inside. And so if we look at this RV free wall right here, it's almost like someone's jumping up and down this free wall, right? It's a little bouncy, like a little trampoline. Well, it indicates to you that there's indentation in that RV free wall. And that's RV diastole collapse, diastolic collapse consistent with tamponade, early tamponade if this person's hemodynamically stable. Again, if I have someone in my emergency department that I see this in and they're normotensive, I'm not saying I'm immediately going to stick a needle into their chest, but I'm also not going to stick around and, and wait for them to just decompensate. I have a higher index of suspicion. I'm going to make arrangements for the fluid to get tapped. And the, at the first instant that they drop their blood pressure, I'm going to be draining that effusion because it can only get worse. Another zoomed in on the RV. We can also put the M mode cursor through. I'm going to kind of skip over this. We can talk about the sessions. But you can also look for scalloping of the RV free wall. That will tell you what's happening to the right ventricle dur dur during different phases. I will tell you that during diastole, this RV free wall should be filling. This is the free wall of the RV right here. This should be filling up. And here it's actually collapsing down. So that's telling us that this is likely RV, um, I'm sorry, um, this is tamponade from RV diastolic collapse. We can look for other things that are telling us that there's tamponade. So we can also look at the left atrial free wall. That normally shouldn't collapse. It's a thick wall chamber, so it shouldn't collapse down. Um, we can look for underfilling of the RV, because if we're not filling the RV because of tamponade, then we get a hyperdynamic LV. So that's telling us that there's a hemodynamic problem. Um, and again, we can also look at the free wall. Here's an example of that pleural effusion I told you about. See how you have the fluid coming here and kind of stops here and goes behind the descending aorta? You all see that? So that's a pleural effusion, but this person also has a pericardial effusion, as you see the fluid coming between the descending aorta and the left atrium. Okay? We can also look for other adjuncts. We can look at the IVC. This IVC is big and plethoric. We wouldn't expect it to be collapsing if there's tamponade because that blood can't get back to the right ventricle. That's the whole point of tamponade. So this big plethoric IVC that's not collapsing is not 100%, um, but it's going to be very sensitive. If you see someone whose IVC is collapsing down and they have pericardial effusion, it's likely not tamponade if that IVC is collapsing down. However, if you have someone that has fluid around the heart, and that IVC is big, plethoric, not collapsing, you should really consider tamponade. Not 100%, but takes you in the direction to ask the question, is the RV, is the RV collapsing? Is the right, atrial, uh, right atrium collapsing? So just adjunctive things you can do at the bedside to uh, tip you over that edge to actually do something for that patient. We can talk about tapping the heart. You can do it in different views. We can go in a parasternal long axis view. So now with ultrasound, you don't have to go that classic, get a liver biopsy on the way up to get some pericardial fluid. You can actually go ahead and do it at the space that's closest to the surface of the chest. And so you can put the needle in there in the parasternal long axis view. I like the apical four chamber view, so you can put it in there. And it's, oh, the needle's always visualized with ultrasound, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, and of course, you can always go sub xiphoid if you like, too. Using ultrasound, you can see the needle coming into view over here. This is using a curved linear probe. We can actually use a linear probe and see the entire length of the needle coming through, um, which is a preferred way. But you can also use the, the phase array if you need to. And then one thing you can do is once you're in that space, if you're not sure if you went too deep or not, you can take some saline. You can shake it up, agitate it, make it little micro bubbles. And as you inject into that pericardial space, you see all these shiny little things over here? That's, um, that's agitated saline, and what that's telling you is that th you're inside the pericardium. You're, if you see those bubbles inside the ventricles, you got a problem. But you see them around here, around the heart, within the pericardial space. Now you're in the right place. Now you can put your wire. Now you can dilate. Now you can put your catheter safely. All right, very last case we're going to go through. This person comes in, trauma patient. They get resuscitated. Their blood pressure's still low. No one can really figure out why, but they're trauma patients. They say, just give more fluid. They must be hypovolemic. And you know, finally, someone just walks up and says, stop the madness. Let's look at the heart. 
And so apical four chamber view. And anyone want to take a guess at this? So this, L, this is the LV over here. It looks like the base is contracting, but the apex is not. Takasubos, I hear? All right, let's see. You're correct, sir. Takasubos, cardiomyopathy. And just really briefly, this is, you all remember why it's called Takasubos, right? It's an octopus trap, right? All that stuff. That's what it means. Um, but essentially what it means is it's this weird shape where the apex balloons out, but the base is spared. There's different types of Takasubos, but this is the more common type. But what this is, is it's a stress cardiomyopathy. So this trauma patient had an overwhelming adrenergic surge and goes into temporary heart failure. So you can give this person all the volume they want, but all you're going to do is dilate up the RV in time. Remember that RV, the sweet sensitive? rent ventricle, don't hurt it. But the LV is not going to do anything better. So this person actually needs inotropy, no more volume. And so many times these patients go to the cath lab, their coronaries are absolutely clean, but what you confirm is this apical ballooning right here. Just this ballooning right here with sparing of that base of the heart. Just another view of it. All right. I'm going to stop right there. I have a couple of conclusion slides. Um, I think we're over, so we can talk over lunch if you have any questions. But um, does anyone have any questions?